No. I don't see any public. members of the public as yet. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's attendees. Oh, sorry. Where? So if you go, if you open up. Oh, now, now, I, now I see them. A bazillion of people. <laughs> Just John Accardi. John is the one who is, uh, yeah. so you need to bring him to. Uh, yeah, so let me transfer him over. To the front. Brenda, Brian Weber, Carl. Hello, Carl. Hello, Colleen. So I think we could. Uh, Matt is also here. Yeah. <sighs> so I guess what we should do is um, do a, a formal introduction. So this is the Transportation Committee of uh, Community Board 4. Uh, sure. September sure. version, and uh, we are working on, we, we are online, as you can see, and we have uh, uh, about eight or uh, nine members, which is a, a quorum, and we're going to uh, follow that through uh, with the way we are doing things this we get we have the agenda item, we uh, listen from the applicant or the general uh, you know, presentation. We have a discussion and question and answers from the committee members, and then we open it to the public. And in order to be open to the public, you should uh, raise your hand in, uh, uh, in the, the panel, which is participants or the panelists, and we will call you in the order we see it. So the first question, and then we take a vote, and our vote is a recommendation that goes to uh, that goes she to. She sees. Yeah. She sees. I see. Oh, I, yeah, I, see you. No, I see too much of you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are. You have taken Christine, over my screen. Christine, okay. we wanted to add something to new business at some point. <clears throat> okay. The agenda. All right. So why don't you tell we'll us? Do that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, the first item on the agenda is uh, the, uh, you want to do the, turn, the, <clears throat> the turning <clears throat> turning movement at Thirty Sixth Street in Ninth Avenue. Christine, and we have uh, John Accardi, who is the person who is. Uh, asking for it. So, John, uh, you can uh, explain to us what the problem is. Chris, can you all hear me now? Yes. Oh, I'm sure sorry, Dale. Chris, do, do you want to intro the uh, committee members? Yes, I should do that too. Thank also, you. Also, it's been noted that your name does not appear on your screen and you might want to change it so people... Myself? No, I'm sorry, John. Uh, Christine, your name does not appear. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Yeah just to make it easier for everyone. Sure. And John, we'll just take one moment to introduce all the committee members. Of course, sure. right. Uh, I'll so, just go, since I'm blabbing, Dale Corvino, co-chair. Right, I'm um, Christine Berte, co-chair. Then we have Janine, who is Pretente, who is our uh, uh, administrative support from, and planner from the community board. David Warren, Martin Treat. Yeah. Uh, Viren Brambat, Raksha Mutuku, Brett Furfer, Colin Wright, Sarah Appleton, David Solnick, uh, and Rob Walker on the phone. So going back to, thank you all for being there and uh, giving us a quorum and participating. And uh, John Accardi now is finally going to tell us what his concern is about 36th Street. John. Okay, well, it, it's an ongoing problem that we noticed, and it's, it's, it's pretty consistent. As a matter of fact, today we had an incident where a cyclist almost got hit by a car. This happens pretty regularly, sometimes on more than one occasion per day. I even took a photograph of the, uh, the car and the bike today. And we, it typically gets our attention because we often hear the cyclists uh, yelling out to the motorists. They feel that the motorists are not seeing them. Now, 
it seems to be a problem that, in fact, it's a blind spot that for whatever, whatever reason, the, the motorists are not seeing the cyclists right beside them. So, John, their, for those people who list. don't know, for John, those people who don't know the context, the little context here is that this is the bike lane going down Ninth Avenue, and at 36th Street there is a split phase. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, a mixing zone, and when the cars are turning, obviously, uh, pedestrian as well as bicyclists are in danger, and there are a lot of conflicts there. And, Correct. and John, explain your, uh, the position of your uh, establishment. Well, my, my establishment, I have Vito's, Slices and Ices. It's the pizzeria right at the corner. I'm at the uh, southeast corner of 9th and 36th. So I have a perfect vantage point as to what's going on at the corner opposite me. Uh, now, we had an incident about, oh, about two months ago, more or less, I was working outside on my street eats. I was building my outdoor uh, seating area. And uh, a van actually hit a girl on a, on a bike and it broke her foot. It, it contorted it in a pretty bad way. Uh, and you know, it seemed, quite frankly, it seems that the motorists just don't see the cyclists right beside them. Right. And, uh, and this is an ongoing problem. We see it over and over again. And sometimes I'm even afraid to look. I'm thinking, I don't want to see someone get really, you know, run over. Right. But it happens regularly. It happens regularly. The cyclists think that the motors are just not paying attention or looking. But I think it's more than that. They're just not noticing them. Right. Uh, and it's a, it's a dangerous situation. Uh, if it was, you know, every now and then. But this is pretty regular, this, this reoccurrence. So, so it's, a concern. it's a concern for people's safety, essentially. So the suggestion was to install a uh, split LPI, like there is one at 38 and 9, and uh, that gives you a, um, a an exclusive red uh, phase for the, the, the cyclist to go through. And mm -hmm. then after that, a blinking yellow, so that the, the, the motorists know that they should be really careful before they turn. I would think so, yeah. I think. Uh, 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 a traffic signal for the cyclist, uh, whether it's a green, amber, or red, whether they should go or not, uh, might help. Okay. And it might give the motorist, you know, an indication that perhaps it shouldn't make that turn until their signal turns green. Uh, that might be the solution. Uh, so need, in, this corner needs to have something because. Right. Does yes. anyone have, uh, 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 who has, anyone has a question on that uh, matter of, of the, you know, it seems to me that's something, that's something we have done before and it has been effective and that we should ask again and put some uh, pressure on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Can I get a motion of that? Oh, David, do you have a question? Oh, everybody has. Uh, I mean, it's really. Up. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So this is an issue that comes up. It's like a theme that pops up from time to time. Um, just the whole mixing zone. Didn't DOT? Um, weren't they supposed to be studying the mixing zones and and checking the safety? Because I mean, we've had all kinds of issues with these mixing zones. Yeah, you're, you're just out, right outside where I am here on 25th and, and 8th Avenue. I can just sit and watch that corner. If I, you know, I don't have to watch any thrill movies on Netflix or anything. I just watch that corner where we got a mixing zone and it's pl plenty scary. Um, so I think, um, so I think, yes, we should be addressing this. This has been identified as a, um, a hot corner where we've had a recent uh, incident so let's just try to put the fire out. But I think this is just another reason for us to keep DOT accountable for these mixing zones that we've long identified as, as dangerous, um, dangerous designs for, for bicyclists. Yeah. Colin. Colin? Yeah, thanks, Christine. And also thanks, John, for coming out, you know, on a Wednesday night because you're concerned about safety of people outside of your business. I think that's really great. Okay. Um, I, I want to, I mean, my, my comment is similar to Brett's. Like I, I, 
I'm curious, John, are you familiar on Ninth Avenue on nearby streets? Is this also happening, you know, in other mixing zones and, and other nearby streets? Like, is this something that's yeah. like more of a problem down Ninth Avenue that we could address? Because I know, Christine, well, I could go on all night about Ninth Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, quite, be one to be thing. honest, yeah, I don't know of the uh -huh. other intersections like I do here because I'm pretty much here throughout the day and I see what goes on here. Like I said earlier, there was one incident today and I photographed uh, the motorist and the cyclist where they started to argue, you know. Uh, luckily, the cyclist didn't get hit as far as I could tell. So I kind of looked over after the cyclist went to the other side of the car. Uh, but as far as the other intersections, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Not, not from my firsthand experience, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll take that though, because I was very involved into uh, that discussion. So um, DOT did a, a study and did a uh, pilot and uh, they concluded that there were two ways of, uh, and, and they have a, a report online about that, by the way. And they concluded there are two ways which are better than uh, that. And there are the two ways that they do install going forward. One is to put a, an extended re refuge and the extended refuge forces the cars to turn at, at an abrupt angle or, uh, or putting the split phase, a split LPI one of the two and uh, whenever they install a new bike lane they do that the problem with the retrofit they plan to retrofit but they said they would do that only when they were resurfacing of the avenue so you know that could take 10 years and that's not good so what we need to do is elevate now if i don't know if you're at the beginning of this year we sent an email uh, a letter to dot asking them for safety at, at 31 intersection and all the mixing zones were included in that letter but indeed nothing has happened so now we need to re elevate you know and put a priority on some and this one would be a good one i know that on 38 and 9 this is my street and i had complained about it a lot and they installed a split you know a split lpi and it makes a huge difference huge difference i mean you know now you feel comfortable going through it uh so you know if we can get a few of them at a time then i think this is a good way and i think 36 is definitely one we should get but yeah i mean i would have liked you know uh, dot to retrofit all of them but uh, and and now with the issues of budget i'm not sure we are going to get there faster so we really need to pick pick up the bad ones and i think this one is a bad one unless colin you have another one that you want to add in the same letter and we can do that uh i'm not aware of any off the top okay. of my head I, that's I, I was curious if john was aware of any yeah. other hot spots yeah. over in that area um, i would like to add 30th street 30th yeah. street is really bad 30th Street's also under significant construction with the water main. Yeah, water. right now it's really. Well, we could suggest that then when they finish doing it, yes. they do it, they retrofit it, which is, which would make sense, right? Yeah. Okay, so Colin, you still have one? Oh, David has something. David Solnick. Um, David Solnick. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna advocate for making this broader than one intersection um, but Christine, you've said we've already tried that and it's not been successful and the city's broke, so why bother? <laughs> right, right, so, right, exactly. So, you know, I mean, it's just so frustrating. I mean, the guy, the, who is the, the guy at DOT who's a bicyclist, uh, a male guy, um, who, who Ted, often comes- Ted Wright. Who comes and presents to us. Ted uh, Wright. What is it? Ted Wright. Ted. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we first started complaining about the mixing zones, he was, he was completely dismissive. Right. And, and he said, well, look, I'm a bicyclist and, and you know, these are okay. And, you know, and, and he was a very self-righteous. Well, David and, doesn't, you know, the DOT is here, so don't get personal about it. But let's, that attitude, let's focus on the issues and not on the people. Well, okay. I think that attitude has gotten better but it's still, 
you know, it, there's still vestiges of it. And, you know, obviously the mixing zones are a catastrophe. And, right. you know, now, and now we're having to grovel to get one of them changed. Right. Yeah. If, if I could just second, like, what I meant to say, Christine, about Ninth Avenue, like, I don't need to tell you, like, Ninth Avenue between 50th, 60th Street and 30th Street is horrible. Horrible. Right? The, the resurfacing, there's yep. mixing zones in the 50s, you know. Um, I know. And with the, the open streets now, there's a spot there that I'm always afraid I'm going to hit, like, a server with a big carrying a big tray of plates or something. Well, you should steal some, uh, some, uh, some alcohol as you are on the way. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> have an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> Give me your It keys. sounds like you might have already picked it clean. <laughs> 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 but anyway, that's what I was, like, like, I think Ninth Avenue definitely needs to be addressed. You know, so why don't we make a resolution where we talk about all of Ninth Avenue, where we talk about the construction at, uh, you know, up there, the resurfacing in between the work, the and but but you know generally we are more successful when we do one off. You know you know that when we get all excited about one intersection it works, and when we talk about a lot then nothing happens. So I think I think we need to be focusing on this intersection and then adding the rest behind it, saying okay and by the way all these other things also should be addressed really because. I because of that special situation of construction and on, of which, which has really created a, a lot of, of concerns. I and it's an opportunity to re redo it the right way. I think there's, a, there's phrasing of a letter that can address, uh, focus specifically on this intersection while saying these problems are, uh, are so ubiquitous. No, in in these yeah. instances where you have this specific kind of intersection along the stretch of Ninth Avenue in our district, is Colleen there? Could Colleen, can you can you um, help us a little bit here? I am here. Yes. Hi, Colleen. You are. Hey, David. I love that comment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you made <Thank> my you. <laughs> evening. <laughs> so, Colleen. Uh, I mean, what are the chances we have of retrofitting some of those intersections after the construction is done? You know what? I think you might stand a good chance in getting it done because construction, um, if you put it in before the construction is done, I think it, you, know, you might stand a chance in getting it done. The only way we can do this is, is, is if you're right, if we resurface um, the roadway. Yeah. The only time we can do that, but I would put together, you know, I think the board had sent us a list. I'm not sure. Yes, in January, in January, we sent this. I just read it because we yeah. were going to discuss the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the budget. So I just I read would, that I letter. Would, I would, oh my God, I that would was really a good it. And the fact that construction is happening at a particular location where there's a mixing zone, you know, it's worth exploring to see if it can be done at the same time before everything goes back into place. That'd be and, really good. Yeah, and you know, yeah, we can definitely take a look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's, do, do I have a resolution? Do I have a motion here? Well, I, I move that we uh, write a letter targeting this intersection as well as targeting uh, the rest of the intersections in Ninth Avenue, sort of reiterating the, the um, changing them when the uh, resurfacing happens after the construction is finished. Right. Second. Yeah. All in Are favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Present non eligible? That's okay. John, could you uh, send us the pictures you have taken? Is John still there? John, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Will you let could me you send us the pictures you have taken? Yeah, should I email it? Yeah, should you email that to uh, Janine and that'd be great. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for My pleasure. Uh, being concerned. We appreciate Christine, that. Sorry. Quickly, before we move on to the next item, we might want to uh, recognize the uh, representatives of electives that are in the, in the, okay. at the meeting. You want to do that? Uh, sure, let me get into that window. Um, 
Participants, okay. Uh, we have Carl Wilson here. From Corey's office. From Corey's office. We have Matt Ty from Dick Godfrey's office. Emily Bartos. Uh, we have Emily from um, Linda, Rosenthal. Linda Rosenthal's office. Am I missing anyone? Hello, all. Welcome. And of course, we recognize Colleen from the DOT. Right. Okay. All right. Okay, so what was the second? The second item was the complaint we received from an individual uh, who lives on 54th Street and unfortunately it doesn't seem to be there unless this is the person with a phone number. There is a phone number 212 and terminating in 414. The, the person who sent us the, the initial letter, there actually were two uh, people who uh, raised this issue, is Stefan. Stefan, are you in the, at the meeting today? I can, if he's not, I can summarize his points. Why don't you do that? Yeah, so Stefan is a resident of West 54th Street, the uh, Midtown North Precinct block. And he wrote to us in July, July 23rd, to say that uh, uh, he was asking about uh, the duration of the barricading on that block, and he was not provided with any certainty or answers from anyone at the precinct. And also, um, he has had, he had, at the time, he had ongoing issues with being stopped and asked for, like, uh, his intentions or whereabouts or, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, hold on. <laughs> sorry. Uh, or my cat is, uh, uh, rubbing up against the laptop. And, um, so anyway, he, he's just, he was just, uh, essentially complaining about his treatment at the barricades, that he didn't sign up to be, um, interrogated by police officers about his whereabouts and his comings and goings as he came and entered his apartment. Um, also that it had it caused trouble for him with as far as like uh, getting car services or uh, ride shares and also uh, it obviously it interfered with traffic and then a committee member also um, noted at the same time that the business, the restaurant business that's on the corner of 54th and 9th Avenue, which is a Mexican restaurant called El Centro, was not able to um, have the same street presence that other restaurants had in order to keep them in operation because of the barricading. Um, that was uh, Blake who wrote to us um, sometime after uh, Stefan wrote to us. Hmm. So <clears throat> those were the, that's the gist of the complaints from uh, West 54th Street. So uh, uh, we Sorry, there, was one other, there was one other person, Charlie Todd. He's, the, he's here today, um, who also had some complaints about the barricades. Oh, oh okay. Is he Charlie? here? Why don't you let him Yeah, I'll allow him to talk. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Um, and I've got some children near me, so I apologize. But <clears throat> I live on 51st Street. I um, do not live on the Midtown North Precinct block. I live across the street um, between uh, 9th and 10th. Um, but because I live on 54th, I frequently walk down 54th with my stroller, with my children, uh, which, by the way, in, I've had a chronic problem of the police officers parking there. <clears throat> they park on the sidewalk. Sometimes they park so close to the police precinct that I cannot fit my stroller in between their car and the, uh, the community court or the precinct building itself, because there's a bump out with stairs there. And I've, I've worked with my neighborhood community officer several times and pointed this out and it's gotten better, but it still happens. Um, but yeah, I, I, I found it to be absurd that they basically turned all of that block into their personal parking lot for months. I understand there was civil unrest. I understand there may have been <clears throat> a credible threat, but I mean, they, they did this. This is not our local problem. They did this at every precinct all over the entire city for months. And I don't think there was a credible threat of rioting in the streets two weeks ago. By the way, they took it down two days ago. Um, it's completely gone now. Um, so I think we're just sort of litigating their past mistakes now rather than trying to change something. Although I think we could advocate for them in general to not park their cars all over the sidewalk. <clears throat> um, I was particularly upset because there's a city bike rack at 54th just um, right there in that corner and it's right on the corner 
but they were not allowing city bike members to dock or retrieve bikes uh, because they weren't at, at one point they were not allowing anybody onto the block and i worked i emailed with the neighborhood community officer and just sort of pleaded my case why don't you move the barricades back 20 feet and allow people just to get a city bike and come and go the response i got was the next closest city bike rack is 8th avenue and 52nd street uh, which i did not find acceptable at all um, i will say there was a brief period where they were letting pedestrians and bikers through this through their private parking lot and no cars, and that was probably the best configuration because there were no cars, and I could just bike and walk on it, walk on it without the cars altogether. Um, but uh, anyway, it, the problem seems seems like they've they've solved it. Um, I don't know if that's citywide or if that's permanent, but uh, I found it to be very disrespectful to commandeer an entire block for your personal parking and not allow rent to walk or bike through. So Charlie. Um, I have a question for you. I mean, obviously this is kind of past, we are all very upset about it, but it's it's kind of, it seems to be somewhat over. And it may be the result of the letter we sent, by the way. So we're going to take the credit for that. <laughs> so. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I mean, how is, what is the situation with the parking uh, right now? And, and Well, and, I mean- Can you access I've... the sidewalk and is it is it reasonable or not? I don't find it to be reasonable. I mean, it's in front of their, there's certain places, you know, in front of the MTA building there, they have bollards, so they can't park on the sidewalk there. Right. I mean, I would just broadly say, please should not park on the sidewalk ever. No one should park on the sidewalk. It's a sidewalk. It's for people. It's for strollers. It's for people with wheelchairs. It's social distancing. I don't need to be walking single file and cramming bass right. past somebody during a pandemic. Um, but, you know, the, my individual issue of complaining about not being able to get my stroller, which is a single wide stroller, through uh, a spot I I've been complaining for about two years with the precinct with the community officers and it's, it's gotten better it, it's not it's you know I still see it every now and then um but um you know but I, for I example know. I, in uh, in on on 35th street we have the same problem obviously and right. for a while we had installed we the, the, the Times Square Alliance, I'm sorry, the 34th Street Partnership had installed some flexible bollard to define where the, 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 the ultimate, you know, where the on sidewalk portion could be and limit it to a certain amount so that the rest would be really passable. Is that something that we could ask? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I understand that uh, a, a high percentage of the NYPD does not live in New York City, so they have to drive drive in. I mean, by the way, I would I would also extend it to my block on 54th between 9th and 10th is nothing but placard parking the entire block. Um, so it you know just living here, you feel like the entire curb is dedicated to the police force. Um, but um, I, I noticed that they have painted lines on the sidewalk, like you know white painted lines for parking, and I was kind of rolling my eyes at that when I saw that today. I think they may have painted it. Uh, during the pandemic, during their occupation. But um, now that you point that out, maybe it's not so bad. At least then we would know the limit. You know, if we're, if we're yeah, going to agree as a community that they're allowed to park on the sidewalk, which I don't necessarily agree with that, but if we're going to say that's a compromise, then yeah, there should be a line and they should not park over the line. Well, and not only a line, but vertical bollards to, to, yeah. to show yeah. them where For do they time. go and they can't go any further than that. I think we need to put the, 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 the genie back in the bottle, you know. <laughs> they expanded their use and then now we have to... Uh, tell them politely that this would be a good time to show some, to rebuild some trust with the community and to give some, you know, give some thoughts about uh, defining better their use of the sidewalk, which we object to, but if they have to, they must uh, delimitate with a, uh, a bar and, and leave at least four feet or five feet so that, you know, uh, ADA, uh, can go through and the strollers can go through. I think that's well put. I agree. Right. And we could send that to, I mean, I don't know what are the other location. Can you, can you tell me whether on uh, the 10th precinct they have the same problem? Viren? Uh, yes, I, I, I sent you some pictures a few minutes ago. Um, it's opened up. They don't stop people anymore. There are no personnel at the corner. Right. But the sidewalks are partially blocked. So you have about okay. four feet of a gap that you can walk through. Right. There's no problem with the sort of cars being parked on the sidewalk because the sidewalk is roughly about three feet, four feet wide. 
in most places. Uh, but you do have sort of a majority of parking taken over by NYPD. So why don't we send, you know, to Midtown North, to the 10th, to Midtown South, because we have a problem enormously. I don't know the 13. We can send it to the 13 anyway. I'm sure that's the same thing. And, and we could send a letter, uh, you know, thanking them for reopening, you know, and then at the same time saying, however, there are still some difficulties for circulating. And, you know, the sidewalk is a major issue and we need to have a better delineation between the cars and the pedestrians and making sure it's open and making sure that the people with strollers can go through, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore recommend that they install those vertical bollards, which are very uh, inexpensive, but would be a good signal of, you know, get back in your, in your lane in a sense, right? So do we have- Christine, before we do that, um, yeah. I I think it's unacceptable that they park on the sidewalk. First of all, they have the placard parking, which is guaranteed through their union contract. There's no need whatsoever for them to park on the sidewalk, and they're setting a bad example for other motorists to do the same thing. If they're parking on the sidewalk, then anyone can park on the sidewalk. I mean, um, you, you can't you have a different standard for them. They're already getting free parking. So, I mean, mm -hmm. th I don't know if there's any regulation. It might be a regulation where you can't actually park on the sidewalk. No, there is if a regulation. I read it, which says you absolutely cannot park on the sidewalk. I so think then they're even violating, if you have a car card, you can't. Then they're violating that specific law, and right. they're flaunting that violation. So they're setting a horrible example. And I think that's where we should go. Is that you, you are breaking the law, and it's not an emergency. I understand if there's an emergency, but this is on an everyday basis. Is, right. So I think we shouldn't even give them any wiggle room on that. Look, you got your placket parking, union contract. You know, if somebody wants to reopen that can of worms, that's not our issue at the moment. But right now, our issue is that you are violating the law when you're supposed to be enforcing the law. Yeah. I, I agree um, with David. Viren, what do you think? Oh, David, okay. No, uh, Viren, what do you think? No, no, I, I, I think a couple of things. I'm parking on the sidewalk is not permitted in New York City, so I think we should put something in, in the letter. The second thing is, um, moving forward, going back to Dale's point, that if there is a need for you to put the barricades back on, are you following the process? Are you informing, you know, in, informing the people on the blog? Because they simply just do it, and there's no kind of due diligence. I mean, I'm just going to weigh in here and say there's like, I, I completely recognize your approach, Christine, which is like more with honey than with vinegar. However, uh, we have had this like. The, the basis, and we just heard testimony from um, Charlie and, and we heard testimony from a couple of other people, residents of 54th Street. One of the main issues with the police barricading was that they did not do any notification of the public as required by the charter. That's the thrust of our letter. Not only are you doing something and not communicating about it and claiming that it's because of these emergencies, these, um, these emergency situations, but you're not notifying us. You are bucking civilian oversight in this regard. So um, I, you could tie all of the occasions, all of the creep that has happened with our, the NYPD, bucking civilian oversight and flouting laws and tie it to that. Like, I, I get that you want to thank them for removing the barricades, but the well, barricades... We, we don't have to thank them. I mean, that's The fine. barricades shouldn't have been there after five right. days unless they have to thank them, but, uh, of but, the reason and the duration, and they never did that. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to move on from the barricade. I know that the whole full board is going to be very uh, agitated about that. So... No, I, I, and I totally, I totally get that. I mean, it's like we should talk about this almost like, like, you know, strategically, because like, 
there is so many there are so many reasons I mean, we are, a, we are like a bullied city, right? There are so many reasons to like treat the NYPD with this kind of these kid gloves and this tenderness and not confront them and not, not like call them to task and not ask them to be accountable. And so instead we beg for scraps. So if we're gonna beg for scraps tonight, okay, but I, you know, I'm at my limit of begging for scraps from the NYPD. To me, they're a rogue force. And they have not been, they have not been compliant with basic tenets of civilian oversight. Okay, but so what? What do do we have a resolution here on the table? I I, I I'm not proposing a resolution. I'm just okay. saying like, I wanted to I wanted to um, elaborate on the gamut of possible approaches to this. We can beg. We can be sweet. I can say please. I, I propose a resolution that we enforce the uh, rules where you can't park on the sidewalk and let them know that. That would be my resolution. The barricades are gone. So well, we, don't you know, enforce, let's, we don't enforce traffic. I mean, they do. So. You no, know, no, I'm saying, but there's a rule on the books. Put that law in that, that they're violating and say, look, you're supposed to be enforcing it and you're violating it and you're setting a bad example. What's to stop a civilian from doing it? What, what, I mean, it's unfair to stop a civilian. Hey, David, I understand that that's, that's the holding them accountable approach on that particular issue. And I would roll it up into other issues as well. I'm just saying like, I'm, I'm asking us as a committee to weigh the possible outcomes. Like we can tell them they're, they're being bad actors in the civic space of the streets of the precincts. And they will say, you know, they'll trash can our letter. Okay, so I have two more people here to uh, get in the game. Colin. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the specific remedy, I think that it makes more sense just to say that they can't park on the sidewalk. I'm not really in any mood to like compromise with the NYPD. I think that they're actions have been like reprehensible. I don't think that we need to be rude in our letter or like overly, you know, um, agitative, but I think also they're not supposed to park on the sidewalk. And so I don't think they should, we should compromise and let them park on the sidewalk. Okay. And then Brett. For, for. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole issue of parking on a sidewalk, this is speaking to something that's, um, you know, again, the, you know, the, the longer, the longer we're on the board, the, the more we find that we have these chronic issues. It's, it's parking on the sidewalk. It's, it's taking over a street to park their, their squad cars on without asking us here, you know, like 29th street when they just parked up 29th street overnight one day. It's like, you know, how do they do this? And I guess they're negotiating with who DOT or somebody. Um, so I, I don't know if a resolution is going to be terribly effective without, um, at least not to the not to the NYPD. I think it's got to go through the electeds because the electeds maybe stand a chance at, at wielding some kind of power over over a policy issue in the streets. Um, you know, as as we're talking, you know, it, NYPD is going to do what they're going to do. They're going to say we need the street. We have these squad cars. Where we're going to put them. You know, give us a garage. We're not. You know, they're not going to get a garage. They're going to have these squad cars. So, I would like for them to be coming to us to talk about where their squad cars go. Parking on sidewalks happens um, on other blocks as well. It's not just that block. Um, you know, in our district and neighboring districts, um, same thing used to, I used to work on 30th Street uh, in District 5 and, you know, where they have the, the traffic uh, police there. And all of a sudden they started taking over that street too. And that happened, you know, a decade ago. And so I, it's, it's, it's how they do things. It's, it's a policy issue. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we need to get an elect, get, get the electeds involved. Um, maybe that's who the letter goes to. Um, maybe it's a bigger issue. It's a town hall issue. Um, you know, maybe we need to show up in force to, to some of the police uh, district meetings to talk about this, but it's, it's a big issue in terms of, um, us being subject to whatever the NYPD is going to do with this podcast. Maybe, uh, thank you, Brett. I think maybe it would be helpful to like, 
hear from some of the reps that are here if they have any like feedback or input because i know it's i know it's challenging for all everyone in uh elected positions to to hold the nypd accountable it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics against that happening so what do you think christine should we ask um, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think I think the uh, elected, which have been very effective, you know, the relationship between de Blasio and NYPD. What are they going to do? Who is going to do what? Nobody. I mean, you know, my view is that they are out. They are not being controlled right now. They are not accountable to anybody. So my view was to try to get to leverage the position where we are. Where, that we created by asking them to be accountable to us on the closures and say, you didn't do your job, right? And now to tag along and to go right behind it and say, oh, and by the way, something which is left over from those closures is that everybody's parking on the sidewalk and we can't have that. And don't park on the sidewalk because the pedestrians can't go through. Yeah. This is not good. And so, so, you know, kind of taking, uh, you know, leveraging a little bit our position as a follow-up without going back to the rest of it and say, you know, this is another, this is a leftover and you, you are not finished with your job here. You have to really leave the sidewalk. And, sorry, and I'm, perhaps I'm, tying it, I'm sorry, and quickly just, and perhaps tying it to like uh, social distancing in the pandemic. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, I like the idea. I mean, I, but I also I think we should be quoting the law and emphasizing that they're violating the no, no, law that are, they're supposed to be we'll enforced. Include, we'll include the law in a way that doesn't say violent words, right? But we'll yeah, we'll oh yeah, I mean, it's better wording. We'll I refer mean, to the law which says you are not supposed to be on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and this is still an issue, even that the fact that the blocks have been reopened, we still have a problem. And we are still getting complaints. Yeah. And since they're talking about sort of building the bridges and building back the sort of community right. trust, right. I think we should put that up front and say, moving forward, if there's better communication in terms of barricades going up, exactly. coming down, or whatever have you, us knowing would make us much more comfortable than simply being imposed upon us. Exactly. I, I just want to add also that I'm just taking, they're, they're going to see that another thing that they're going to look at is the fact that uh at least on 20th street i'm not sure about 45th street they have actually lost some parking to uh restaurant um outdoor spaces that's so. life i know i i <laughs> you know what if there is no restaurant there is no tax revenue and there is no salary to the police right. Right. So somebody saying, has to look at this. Okay. This okay. Look. Not only do you want us to give up these spaces so the restaurants, yeah, 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 tables and chairs out, but you don't want us to do what we've already been doing as an established custom right. to squeeze in as many police vehicles as possible on the block. I'm just putting it out there that you know we might even say while well, we identify, you know, we or even say like we can you know, we'll support your, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you to find alternative parking locations. I actually disagree with that. Like, let's not even touch it. Let's not bring more problems to their attention. I appreciate you like being like, I appreciate that you're raising something very smart, Dale, but I think let's just not even give them reasons to object. Yeah, you're probably right. So. right. <laughs> okay, so could, could someone uh, summarize this, uh, make a resolution so I, we can vote on it? I mean, I can tell you what I've heard now. I have heard, uh, you know, the, uh, the, their job is not finished. We want to build the trust. We still have a problem. They are parking on the sidewalk. People cannot go through the sidewalk for distancing and for uh, ADA and for, um, you know, strollers. And it really, and, and it is illegal to park on the sidewalk. And therefore we are asking them to not park on the sidewalk. And the emphasis on clearance for social distance reasons for yes, the residents. Also. also. And, and so, better communication moving forward. If they right, right. they should let right. us know. So we'll we'll put a language and we'll send it around so you guys can, you know, improve on the language. But so that's so somebody 
puts a motion on that? I make that motion. Okay. I second. I second. second. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Yes. Aye. Opposed? Present non eligible? Abstain? All good. Thank you so much. Very good discussion. Okay. The next is uh, Dale. You have to take the driver's seat now. Sure. Um, so I passed, uh, well, Janine uh, put the um, City of Oakland's 2019 bike plan in the Dropbox and I also sent you a link. It's a big file. It's like a, it's a, it, it's not a easy download, but it's a comprehensive uh, bike plan that was developed last year by the City of Oakland. And um, looking at it, uh, it was a joint effort of the mayor's office and Oakland has eight city council members, seven uh, by district and one at large. And they all participated as along with a bunch of other stakeholders like uh, their Office of Disabilities, uh, area residents, cycling groups and activists, and uh, a, a couple of nonprofit organizations. Um, and then the transit stakeholders such as Caltrans and BART were on their advisory committee. So it's a pretty um, consensus driven document. And the mission statement was basically, it envisioned in Oakland that was bike friendly and affordable, safe and healthy mobility for all uh, as a vision of cycling. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I of course encourage you all to all look through it, but the, the, some of the things that are kind of key points about it is that it, were the, was the methodology that they employed. They did a kind of a master survey and they also employed uh, what they described as an equity framework. And they also did um, very extensive like in-person and social media outreach on any available channel to get input from the, from the uh, residents. Um, and uh, the, the plan itself has like a kind of uh, built-in built in framework for focusing on disadvantaged groups who may not always have access to this, to cycling as a means of transit. Um, and and um, referring back to what we talked about in a prior meeting with, uh, with the social justice meeting, they, they set clear goals um, to their, um, to the plan, which was to have, for instance, like a large percentage of the residents of Oakland living within a quarter mile of what they call low stress bikeways. Um, I don't think we have any low stress bikeways in Manhattan at least. Um, increasing ridership, and in particular, they had a focus on increasing women's ridership as a kind of benchmark of um, accessibility. So, um, and the plan also included a an economic development strategy component, which was to increase uh, businesses in the bicycle uh, kind of industry um, at, owned by people of color. I thought was a really um, important component of the plan. So there's lots of super uh, interesting and detailed recommendations. And I think a lot of them would have um, great potential here in our district and in the city at large. But I'm not really like advocating, I, we're laying this out as a discussion, but it's not to advocate for like, let's crib their work. It's more like, do we think our city should take on this kind of comprehensive plan and, you know, look at the same kind of like uh, engagement of stakeholders uh, equity framework, uh, business development strategy, and what have you, instead of like just cherry picking like, oh, that's a cool idea, let's do that. <clears throat> so um, yeah, like basically we could advocate for, from our position, a unique plan for our city that has, you know, the same kind of uh, contours as this plan. So I welcome all of your input on that. We have hands up of uh, David Warren. Or it's an old ad. 
I think Sarah. That's an old hand. Oh, it's an old hand. Okay. Brett, is that the brand new hand? That's, that's a new hand. Yes. <laughs> um, so first, first, I, I want to thank, uh, you know, Dale, you and Christine for putting this in the agenda. This, um, you know, I had, a, once I saw it on the agenda, I, I went right to it and um, it's a, it's a phenomenal document. Um, I think there are the two biggest things I would point to for value to us. I think one, I think for all of us on the transportation committee, there are a lot of good transportation issues. Um, how to explain for when we want to advocate for um, alternatives to the automobiles. There's a lot of really good language and things that we can learn from. So that's, that's the educational thing. The other thing that I think is um, maybe the, the most important part of this document, um, it's survey and research based. So what they present isn't a group of people within the city talking to different representatives and different departments putting their personal and, 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 and uh, departmental um, uh, priorities into a document and then finding a way to justify them. They use they use a, a third party to do surveying, um, to reach out to to people, and so they made an Oakland Oakland plan. Um, so I think from our end, if we want to try to um, use this document to help make our our neighborhoods better, um, this is probably something bigger than you know what we could just do. Um, and you know our district doesn't live in a bubble, um, but I can see two potential ways to 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 try to. Um, help the city get inspired. One is it could be a citywide kind of thing. Um, Timing-wise, it might not be great because we're, you know, we're, we're about to head into an election year next year, so the administration might have the time to do a full um, study and get a document out in time for the, the, the next administration. Um, maybe this is more appropriate to bring to Gail Brewer's office's attention um, because of Manhattan bicycle plan, um, I think in some ways is more realizable and feasible um, and you know, could become a citywide kind of thing. But I think Manhattan is almost kind of a, a its own transportation zone. So I, I, that's, I, would, I hope that, um, you know, that, that Gail's office gets their hands on this and can help um, maybe find a university, a, a third party, um, research consultant, uh, someone to do the appropriate to, to, to create something like this for us, which would be amazing. I have a question, Brett, on what you just said. Are you familiar with the RPA, uh, uh, mass, bike master plan? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not like intimately, but yeah. Right. I just, it would be interesting to see whether they have used surveys, etc., before we uh, come I think my understanding is RPA tends to do most of their studies internally in house. I don't think they reach out to third parties. Um, I think the fact that this open plan did use, and you know, I, it, you know, I, 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 I'm a consultant in, you know, so I know that sometimes you get pressure from your clients to, you know, come up with an answer. Sometimes, um, you know, the the, the reputable uh, consultants um, do not listen to their clients when they're pushed. That everything needs to be objective, so um, they're out there. And that if, if someone who's objective can come, can, has findings that um, happen to align with, with some, you know, with your opinions or goals, that's great. And if it doesn't, that's an that's a opportunity for someone to learn and, you know, check where their orientation is because maybe they need to, to realign their goals that they realize that they're not in alignment with everyone else's. So the group think, I think that that's one thing, you know, Gail Brewer doing part of their um, finding new community board members where they do that exercise. I'm sure many of you, most of you probably done that where you do that whole, your plane crash uh, heading to Seattle thing. I mean, that was, a, that's a powerful thing that she did for all of us before we even joined the board or, you know, reapply. Um, it shows that when you bring more opinions to the table that, that, makes a more powerful document. Right. Uh, David Solnik. Um, yeah, I, I too found the, the document to be impressive and particularly impressive as Brett is saying in the, in the survey elements of it. Um, you know, it was particularly, in, particularly um, 
telling that uh, you know they they identified a very large percentage of the population that would like to bite but is scared to. Um, that wasn't their phrasing, but it was that's pretty much what it said. I think it was forty four percent. And and I suspect we would get similar numbers, maybe even higher. Um, you know, and, and it gave, you know, it broke it down into subcategories. What were they afraid of? And, you know, by region. And I mean, it's very detailed, but, but, you know, so having that kind of information would be valuable, but, you know, and now I'm going to sort of argue against myself, which is, are we too late? I mean, in a sense, you know, is the city just going to say, well, look, yeah, I mean, look, we know that we, we know we need protected bike lanes. We know we need to not have mixing lanes anymore. Um, you know, so we're getting rid of them. Um, you know, we already we already kind of know this, and you know, we're we're you know, and and Corey's fifty miles of protected bike, whatever I don't remember what the numbers were, but the you know the program to add protected bike lanes, you know, at a at, a, at an accelerated pace. Um, I'm, I'm just. You know, I would love to know what the results of that survey would be here in New York, um, whether Manhattan or citywide, I think either would be interesting. Um, but the question then I have is, is it going to help? And, you know, is it worth it? Is it going to make a difference? It, you know, there's no point in studying something if you don't think it's going to matter because there, people are just going to say, well, look, we're already on, we're already, we've already gone down that road. You know, now you've just confirmed that we should go down that road. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know okay. what I, mean? I think. I think one thing that. Sorry, uh, I just want to say quickly. I think one thing that distinguishes this document from, like, just a data crunch is that you know the. It clearly outlines an equity framework, which I don't think is part, especially of the RPA plan, for instance, and also that business development component, which you know, here we have. Who runs Motivate now? Who runs the city bikes? Lyft. Are they now owned yeah. by Lyft? I think. Yeah, yeah, Lyft. So we have a we have a we have a very large corporation engaging in the most you know important rollout of as opposed to the Oakland model, which was let's bring up small businesses and especially small business POC owned small businesses to meet some of our um, our needs for cycling. So I think. I get the resistance to like, oh, a survey, like what are we, what are we gonna learn that we haven't already figured out? But a survey tied to an equity framework and to like uh, 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 a social justice oriented business development model, I think this is powerful. more powerful than a survey. Colin is okay. next. I well, first I, I have a quick question for Dale. What is what is the proposal that you're? I mean, I I have a, some thoughts on the on the document, but what are you proposing that we do as a community board? Well, I'm I'm actually not saying like I want you to do. I I'm not formulating like a, a next step. I'm just I'm I'm I think we brought this document to the committee to discuss and to say like if this is something that we would like to see take place in New York, the, the development of a, of a plan that has all these components as outlined. Like how can we, you know, we're not gonna, as um, I think Brett rightly, I think it was Brett rightly pointed out, it's not up to us. We're, this is way bigger than CB4's transpo. Uh, so I think, I think we are not at the decision point of yet doing yeah. something with it. It's right, it, it, it was, the idea was to elevate the debate and to get, smarter about it and then say what do we do about it so Colin finish your your thought yeah I was gonna say well first of all thanks for bringing the document to our attention it's a great document I agree I you know more and more as it, I work nationally I work I, I see these documents a lot and I think that what distinguishes they're all good right they all look good they all say the right things this one has milestones which is good this one is written as an action with action items but the difference is that Mayor Libby Schaff of Oakland is kicking ass in closing streets and you know taking no prisoners you know and I think that like these plans are only as good as the citywide leadership pushing them like they're good to like point to and say we agreed as a city 
you know, that we, that equity and transportation is a goal that we need to get to. And so then you go to community boards and you go to businesses and you go to police precincts and actually make it happen. And I think that's where uh, the comment about the mayoral race is so important. I think that we need to make sure that the next mayor is a mayor that is not going, is this going to be a Libby Schaff? <laughs> um, and <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that's my thought. I think it's a great document, but, but it, takes, it takes action. Uh, Viren. Um, no, I think uh, Dale made, made the point that I was about to make. Uh, tying, this, uh, tying bike infrastructure into equity infrastructure is extremely important. We actually already have bike infrastructure in place. So going back to David's point, it actually becomes easier for to tweak the plans as we go. We're not starting from scratch. So that actually is a good opportunity. And this document ties biking and sort of changed sort of a, a concepts of mobility into demo, demography. So looking at demographics is extremely important. We haven't done that. Because we just take street as infrastructure and we overlay bike paths on top of it. But we don't c connect people, equity and infrastructure together. I think it's a great document to, to sort of look at st uh, study from, I don't know exactly what the mechanism we have to sort of bring about similar changes into what we have. Mm. And that's the question that I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a great conversation. That's all I can say. Where does this conversation go from here? Is it uh, under the purview of this committee or is there some sort of letters that we write to the well, We don't know yet. We don't know yeah. yet. Brett, for for. I think Sarah has her hand up also, just FYI. I, I, for whatever reason, it came up first. So Sarah. Oh, Sarah I already spoke, so Sarah could go before me this okay, time. Okay, Sarah next. Oh, thanks, Brett. That's fine. Um, yeah, just like we'll reiterate, I think it's a fantastic document. I think if we want to try to think like more tactically, um, there could be an opportunity, obviously, like the streets master plan, um, where, you know, the first iteration is supposed to be released by DOT next December. Um, if there are elements of this plan that, you know, we do particularly like or, you know, considerations or metrics they're looking at. Um, and we feel like it's appropriate for us to, you know, write a letter about that. Um, the framing of that could be, you know, we would love for you to be considering this as, you know, we understand you are going to be working on this plan. Um, and just like try to engage in that way um, with DOT. Um, I think realistically, I don't think they're going, you know, we're going to get, you know, an entirely distinct bike plan because there's already been this master streets plan concept that's, you know, been passed with legislation and that's already something DOT is now going to be working on and that's going to include a plan for biking um, and bike infrastructure, presumably. Um, so that was just a tactical thought of how, you know, what we could keep in mind as we're having more discussions about this content. Yeah, that's it. David, uh, so back to Brett. Perfect. Yeah, just one, one other thing I would add, um, I, I meant to add before, if we do want to try to do something locally as a community board to try to get some kind of study done, um, I might suggest that we reach out to, um, uh, some, someone like NYU's the Wagner School, um, since they're kind of our neighbors almost um, close enough. Um, they, that's a kind of way to leverage some academic uh, third party research into, into this and with the idea of creating something local, use, you know, use, use some students to help as part of their education. That might be the win win. That's something, you know, we're, we're a local laboratory for them to study as well. So that's. You know, that's the thing I'd add is something if or, we want to try to tap into the local resources to get this done without going through the city or borough president's office. Or even tying into your earlier suggestion about uh, the borough president's office, like, hey, borough president, why don't you uh, initiate this kind of like, uh, you know, and, and engage some of these academic think tanks to like take on a study of this. We like this study. Like, what about a scope like this? Mm -hmm. Instead of us going to students and saying, hey, we're from this one district in Manhattan and we want you to do this thing. Yeah, that would be, you know, it would be Jesse or somebody reaching out, but um, yeah. 
yeah i mean it's it, it's a way to to try to get it done and yeah maybe you know gail could could talk more far wide so she might have more of an inroad for doing this um but you know touching on the on the idea of you know the, the equity and things like that so one thing it's, it's not entirely clear in the report is if the whole thing about equity and and some of the the vision um objectives it, it's not entirely clear if those were findings from the survey or if the survey was just measuring you know the the, the factors influencing people riding bicycles or not so um so there is there is some policy overlap with what's going on in this report that it's not entirely clear um i i i my personal preference for reports like this and studies is before you know the the, the, the there's separate tracks one is a visioning which is which could also be done objectively with the third party to run these visioning to know what the policy should be and then the data does get you it, it can be useful for us for the things we advocate for i guarantee you if you did a survey and ask people what are the five worst things about bicycling in our neighborhood um everyone's top five list is going to include double park cars you know that you but someone else could put that survey out there we can point to that and say hey look people are afraid of the double park cars we have data that shows that crashes are you know x percent involved double park cars so that's that's something that can be sent directly to the mayor's office to say, you need to be making this a, an initiative, a, a priority to crack down on double parked cars in our district because this is causing um, a dangerous situation and it's also discouraging people from using bicycles. So that's that's how there is, it's not just about making a plan so they can, the city can budget where to roll out protected um, bike lanes. It's other policy issues too that these kinds of surveys are useful for. So um, uh, I have one suggestion. Wrap up this part. Okay, uh, David Warren, that is the hand up. Yeah, I agree with everyone. I, it's uh, Dale, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, I definitely think this, if we do continue this, it should go to the borough wide uh, committee and then to the city wide within the community boards if we're going to do this. I don't know how this how we relate to other boroughs. I was riding in the South Bronx yesterday. And it was like the Wild West. You know, you go out to Bronzeville, East New York. Also, uh, the big, so that's, there's a big economic disparity, you know, in some of the neighborhoods that don't have people to advocate for them. Also, there's a huge, huge female, there's a gender gap in cycling for females because of the way the infrastructure is set up. I think we'd have more males about, also. David, what about the reports? Because those well, things the report, are what I mean, that's what the report what already said in the report. Right. Um, I think that the, the way the reports were getting local groups to get involved, I think it, if we do that, it has to be local groups within the city. It can't just be our area because it has to be, like the report okay. said, connectivity. Well, so yeah. we have to be connected, even though it's not directly to Bronzeville and East New York or or Brighton Beach or Queens. So right. I would like somehow, I don't know if there's a mechanism for that, to be honest with you, with the community boards so, out there. Oh, Vera, and then last but, one. May, may I interject? I, I think that there are mechanisms in place. We have agencies, we have DOT, we have city planning, and we have design commission. Design commission works very closely with city planning in terms of any kind of innovative ideas that communities put forward. Uh, so, you know, why, why take the onus on us? Put the onus back on the agency and say, when you do your studies, please include X, Y, and Z. So these, these plans become very comprehensive. In fact, Design Commission is very positive and receptive more often than not, actually, because it's one of those agencies that actually reaches out all the other folks. So I think we should explore the possibilities of kind of establishing a dialogue with them. Agreed. Okay. Um, so I, what I heard, I didn't read the report. I just got the knowledge from all of you, which is wonderful. Uh, the thing that absolutely um, interested me are the uh, uh, quarter of a mile in, from, a, from a bike lane. This is what the mayor of uh, Bogota did when he did his first bus network. And, um, you know, the issue of creating, uh, creating jobs related to bikes, I think it's a fantastic issue. So this is all this equity issue and the survey. Now, 
bringing it all back to our neighborhood. First of all, generally, the community board wants us to write about the community board. And in our community board, I think we have a fantastic network of, net, of, of bikes, bike lanes. We have bike lane, cross town bike lanes. We have north south bike lanes on every avenue, except on 10th Avenue, which is supposed to happen. So, uh, you know, the applicability of this report to our neighborhood is not, is not, is a little, it's a little too late in a sense. Uh, so whatever we would write would be about the other uh, neighborhoods and uh, we would have to find an angle to say how, uh, you know, useful to our neighborhood it would be and then expand it to the rest. I think the angle would be to talk about the, uh, you know, equity and, uh, and, and really the job, developing some jobs. That's something that Viren will tell you it was in the recommendation of the equity task force talking about how to figure jobs and maybe if we take that angle we can say you know this is something we would like to see happening in our neighborhood and we would like DOT to take from that report a number of ideas like that but especially this idea because this idea can apply to our neighborhood and it is part of the recommendation of the task of the working group. So that's, sure. that's the way I would go about it to try to bring that and make it fit in our picture and, and, and you know, have an opportunity to talk about it because otherwise we don't have an opportunity. I mean, it's not our business, you know. It, it, I, you know yeah, you, you know. want to depart from the district right. as it stands. And, and then people are going to say, not of our business. Why are you writing a letter like that? So the only way is to link it to uh, Viren, that that you know the, the the question from your working group, uh, and maybe have you start to look at the report and and extract from that the things that could that fit in the working group and that could be a joint letter. You know, I don't know what you think, Viren, about that. No, and I think it, it's too, it is doable. I think uh, I'm going back to what you said. I see it slightly differently in the sense that because we already have a very well worked out sort of network of bike paths and bike, bike infrastructure, it is easier for us to come in and tweak it. And some sort of study will, we can request for some sort of study that ties equity back into what we already have. Yeah, but I mean, we need to ask for a study of, of something new because there is no money also in the city. So we need, we need to focus more on the economic development aspect of it. Mm -hmm and say, look, we, we just said we wanted to talk about job and economic and racial opportunity, et cetera. That's, now that we have the bike lanes, mm -hmm. how do we, what would be the program to create those jobs around it? And indeed, if there need to be tweaking in the process, we, we can talk about that, but we need to have something which is really very focused to our neighborhood. This is what I, I suggest. I think we'll have this conversation in our next meeting with this uh, social okay. group. At the same time, you know, any thoughts that come in my mind, I'm going to put them together. And I'll, initially, we will sort of, I'll send them to you, Christine, and then we'll see. We'll take it from there. Well, Dale, yes. everybody, yeah. we, can, we can all participate in that. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great conversation, it's irrespective of which, of which committee right. sort of takes it in. But I, I think there are multiple overlaps that we need to explore, and there are other agencies that we haven't thought about. The only reason why I thought about design commission is because they actually look at quality of life much more comprehensively. Oh yeah. So, you know, they, they even get involved and believe it or not, they actually have a document for affordable housing, though it is not their mandate. Right, right. Um, okay, well, I mean, if, if you're all kind of in agreement and then you want to send some thoughts to Viren, uh, that's, that's something we could do. And then, you know, regroup, together next month and do a vote on it if, if we have a, a letter or recommendation that can be taken and, and, and would follow with the, the guidelines of CB4, you know, focus in a sense. But I think this, is, this was a great conversation. It's very, very interesting. This is terrific. Thank you, Dale, for leading that. Uh, okay, so the next subject is um, the budget. Uh, 
no. sidewalk maintenance. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. sidewalk maintenance. Okay, so that's another, maybe we should put it to next month. So another high level discussion. Yeah, another high level discussion. So, and. Uh, How about this, Christine? Why don't we just like encapsulate the, the, the yes. argument and then like have everybody we'll kind of the next, right. and pick it up in October. Right, exactly. It's too much otherwise. But the, the Everybody's sidewalk. Brains are gonna <laughs> sidewalk maintenance. So up to now, we have been working on sidewalk uh, and we have talked a lot about the space. You know, do we have enough space on the sidewalk? Let's clean up the sidewalk, etc. And then the safety. Is it safe? Can we cross the street, etc. And now, um, you know, inspired by two things, by the issues of equity, there are about 3.6 million people who use the sidewalk and probably more, but I mean, we use it in, a, in an intensive way to commute, to, uh, to do the first leg of transit, the last leg of transit, etc. And of those 3.6, 66% are, uh, you know, non-white, I mean, black, brown, etc. So the sidewalk is really a place where equity is very, which, which is really uh, very important. And one thing which is happening in New York City is since 2003, the sidewalk is not maintained by DOT. So DOT, the budget they have and the taxes we pay are spent on the roadway and you know the ferries, blah, 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 but not the sidewalk. And on the sidewalk, this is practically the place where you have the most people walking. And the second thing is that the maintenance is really pushed back to the landlord who pushed it to the, the store owners, right? And all these store owners were all concerned about how are the small businesses going to survive, etc. Well, they have to do the maintenance of the sidewalk. And the maintenance means not only the cleaning, but also the repairs. And if they don't do the repairs, the, 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 the fines can go up to $10,000 and $1,000 a day. So that's a big deal. And, and you know, from an equity standpoint to me, the fact that we are not, the, the money we pay in taxes is not being spent in the location where we have the most, probably the most uh, 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 black and brown, you know, non-white people uh, using it is is really a shocking discrimination. And what I wanted to bring to to you is is, is a proposal to discuss um, how to ask for the sidewalk to be maintained by the city, certainly in our neighborhood and in other neighborhood, and so that we get to a level of equity between the people which are walking, of which many are, um, you know, again non-white, and uh, the people who are driving. And the people who are walking are probably less. Uh, so that's the general idea. And I can send you a document that I started to put together. And, um, and I think it would be great if you could think about it in all the dimension and see whether next month, see whether this is something we want to take on and, and you know, push for. That's it. We can also provide a little, I mean, you did encapsulate it, but just a little bit on the history. Like, uh, there, there must be some document or uh, report, news report that explains how you know, under the Bloomberg administration, there was this decision made to privatize the yeah. of the most public space in the right. city. Right. Right. Kind of give everybody the, the little history lesson behind that and then also, you know, outline the parameters for the discussion. Right. Uh, Viren has raised his hand. Viren? It's the old hand. Old hand. David, it's a new hand on the old hand. No, it's a new hand. Um, <laughs> fresh. I've just, yeah, I've just cleaned it. Um, it. You know, I mean, I I see the angle of, I mean, obviously this is a very important issue and, an, you know, a really, yeah, a, a worthwhile issue, um, you know, but as Colleen has said, you know, in previous meetings, you know, 
fat chance of getting the deal. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, I think the idea would be to, to ask Corey to introduce legislation to, to okay. change that. And that may not be effective now. It may be effective in the next, you know, in the next mayor. Uh, okay. Well, that was... That was that so was, I'm talking about a bigger, a big plan here. But do you think... Yeah, no, I agree with that. That, 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 that having it in the next mayor is, makes a lot yeah. of sense. This but is another this is another stretch goal for our committee. Right. No, but I mean, it it came also from that discussion we had one month ago, where because the sidewalk is not maintained, then we can't do neck down for safety, right? And we're like, what the heck? So first you can say, okay, we're going to ask them to do neck down, to do neck down, and then you say, but why is the sidewalk not maintained, right? No, I completely agree. But let me get my let me get my point out, which is that if you think th this is an angle toward this is you know just a strategy to towards towards implementing this at some point in the near future. Do you think this equity strategy is the best one we've got? I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced. I, I mean, maybe it is. Maybe you're right. And and you know, I mean, obviously, I hope you're right, but. My question is, is this using, you know, ethnicity um, going to get us our, is, is the best path to get to our goal? Uh, well, I don't know. But if we are saying as CB4, which we have said that we were trying to look in every committee and say, let's find some places where there is no equity. I think we found it, right? And and now what are we going to do about it? So, I mean, even if we don't win, I think it's worthwhile to raise it and say, it's, it's pretty shocking. I mean- David, I think maybe your question is, do we lead with the equity issue or do we lead with, we can't get these neck downs, why are the sidewalks privatized? Let's look at, you know, a public- Well, that would be the discussion about the letter and how to present right. it, et cetera, right? And, and you're right. I have thought about different ways of presenting it. I don't know. It, it seems to me, though, if, if equity, if everybody is, is serious about equity, and if the mayoral candidate are serious about equity, uh, that could be a very important issue to address, because that's a very big give. The second uh, angle is, you know, the small businesses. And everybody's trying to have laws here about how to alleviate taxes, how to alleviate this and that. And right there, you can say, look, I'm going to take away from you a big, a big liability and a big I expense. Mean, I mean, and, and that's a big giveaway to give back to the to, to yes, the, that the I actually business, think that's right. I actually think that's a better a better approach. Or so, not, not necessarily instead, but yes. You know, yes. I think all of it, you, you'll see the, the draft. I mean, there it's is a all, lot of- you know, I mean, it's all of a piece and right. yeah, and yeah. we can figure and, out- But there is a lot of things too. I mean, you can talk about, uh, you can talk about the, uh, 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 what is it called? Um, environment. If you really want to do permeable, you know, uh, permeable sidewalks. Yeah. Well, the, the only way is that if the city does it, each of the each of the small shop is not going to do a permeable sidewalk in front of them. You know, we so if this is uh, it, there are fifth, there are five or six issues linked to that that we are all trying to achieve, and then you have the sidewalk, and yeah. Christine, just one, one, one quick point. I mean, you brought up something which is a much bigger issue. I mean, the rest of the world is actually has caught up in civilization. Our sidewalks are from 20th century. Yeah. We haven't reinvented them. We haven't looked at them again exactly. from a design point of view. They become part of product design strategies across the globe. Times Square tried doing something similar in terms of you know, having these uh, pavers that would generate energy and harvest energy and sort of water harvesting and whatever have you. City scales are, I mean, New York City is an amazing scale where you could achieve right. those results. So, you know, we are in the second or end of the second decade of. Um, no, but that, I mean, to me, that's and to me, that's the first step into looking at the sidewalk and reinventing the sidewalk. Where yeah. you, maybe I don't want a sidewalk, but that's be beyond yeah. that, right? But uh, at the beginning, if you don't have the city looking at the sidewalk like they care about it, right now, 
they don't care about it. They don't care about the pedestrian. They don't care about the sidewalk. They don't care about this whole area. And I'm paying taxes for it, which really pisses me off, really, frankly. <laughs> so anyway, I think we can, we can have tremendous discussion about that. Yeah, but the, big, the biggest, big, biggest argument, Christine, is that sidewalks is a collective resource for right. the city. Right. For the city and, and for the community. And, and I think it's the only be, one they don't maintain. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's actually value in actually looking at it as a resource that you can actually draw from. I think that's the kind of argument we can put forward. Again, the mechanism is something that I'm not clear right. So that's, that's another discussion which instead, uh, I thought was matching well with you know, the mission of the equity group and saying, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it does, it does relate to that, but there are many, many, many arguments why the sidewalk should be maintained. So I'll send around some documents and then we can have a further discussion next week. Uh, Brett, is that a new hand? Uh, yeah. So I just, um, just, I know we don't want to make this a long discussion for this month. Um, I would just caution about making equity part of the sidewalk maintenance program because uh, someone I think could very easily say that many of the landlords that have the responsibility of building the, the, the sidewalk are people that are um, not in that, you know, equity, you know, um, you know, these are, these are, you know, if you can afford a, a building in New York City, you probably already have some money. So therefore, maybe we should make those people pay for the sidewalks. Oh, if someone yeah. puts an argue, that argument out there, yeah. that, that could, the whole thing could unravel. Um, I think, you know, the things about like, I think it's really about two things. One, it's about um, the, the current system is not working. And if anybody has any disagreements about that, I will point you to 29th Street and 8th Avenue, where we have a pit in the sidewalk that I'm worried that Landmarks is going to come and say you can no longer fix that because it's now a landmark uh, sidewalk dent. So um, that's one reason it's the effectiveness. I don't think we can say that the current system is working. And I think is you know the point that you're making, Christine, and others is this is you know we talk about complete streets and a holistic approach to transportation. The sidewalk is um, currently absent from that equation. Um, and it makes no sense. I think it's just about doing the right thing. Um, you know, the, the equity thing could be a side conversation while we want to talk about equity and the, you know, the accessibility on sidewalks. Again, if we're not doing a good job with the current system for fixing sidewalks, and so now sidewalks aren't accessible because we have too much sidewalk furniture, we have too many cracks, the, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's also an important issue yeah. that, you know, it's equity when it comes to accessibility too. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with Brad. I think it is, uh, equity is part of it, but it's sort of woven into it. I think that we, we need to have a list of priorities as accessibility, materiality, sustainability. These are the major issues. And, and if you're looking at comprehensively as complete so, streets, I think that if you I feel know, the number. I, I'll so, send you the text because I think, you know, I'm always looking at what is going to get um, you know, the elected officials interested, right? So <laughs> we, we need to find that, uh, that, that part of the equation. Rob Walker. Hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add one or two things. Um, this is a great idea for planting the seeds uh, so we could get legislation so the city takes care of the sidewalks. Uh, we have issues right now with the sidewalks that um, different departments will come in. They will tear up a perfectly good sidewalk to do whatever underneath, and then they'll fill it with asphalt. And then we wait two or three years for them to replace it with cement. And the whole time, whoever owns that real estate out front is like, well, I didn't tear it up. They put a Band-Aid on it, they should fix it. Um, I hope the city does take this over years to come, but the whoever owns that real estate out front needs to be responsible for cleaning that sidewalk for the snow, debris, and so on. That's it. Okay. All right, so- uh, Alan is on, he has a question as well. Who? Alan Oster. Oh yes, Alan. Hey. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, actually it's a follow-up to the gentleman's comment just now, uh, try to keep this simple, and that's snow removal this winter. Um, yeah. In the best of times, uh, we struggle to walk down the sidewalks of our city, uh, retail 
stores who I assume or landlords are supposed to clear the sidewalks by a certain time. Uh, we find that, uh, especially the retail stores, they'll throw out uh, uh, salt and consider that uh, their, their responsibility is over with, or they'll put a little trail in the middle of the street. Um, however, coming winter, since a lot of these retail stores, unfortunately, are not going to be open, um, I have great concerns for our senior citizens or handicapped people, um, parents pushing strollers on the street to get to school or somewhere where it's just going to be impossible uh, for people to really get around this winter. So I'm thinking perhaps the committee in, in maybe through our district manager, if there's some way uh, the agencies can contact um, the building owners uh, especially on the avenues, uh, that they're responsible to maintain the sidewalks this winter um, and, and insist that that will need to be done, that there are going to be inspections on the sidewalks and there will be summons given, given out. Um, again, this is going to be a tough winter, hopefully not a tough winter uh, snow-wise, but if we do get a lot of snow, I'm just concerned that a lot of people are not going to be able to get out of their ho homes too easily. And walking on the sidewalks is going to be a, a challenge for a lot of people. So um, I'm assuming either DOB or somebody has a list of every building owner in the city that has commercial space in the, in the building. Um, obviously, we're hoping that our homeowners um, will take care of their own sidewalks. And that's something maybe the block associations could reach out to their homeowners just to remind them to do that. Uh, but I think we need to put something in the works in terms of the city reaching out to uh, property owners uh, to be aware that um, they need to take care of their sidewalks this winter. Thank you. That's a very good idea. So maybe that's um, maybe that's a, a, a short letter we can send then this month, which kind of start to the ball rolling on the issues of maintenance because that issue is not going to go away. There are going to be a lot of stores closed for quite, for two years, for one or two years. Is that a letter to Corey, to the DO? I think that would be a letter to the DOT and the Department of Finance. Finance has the, I mean, DOT could, could go to finance. I mean, you see, that's the problem, is that then it's sanitation, it's DOT, who is it, you know? Um, uh, people are supposed to, maybe that's to both of them, and say, look, this is, this is an issue upcoming, and you should um, remind people that landlords, that they still need to do the maintenance. Right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, a good, that's a good start. That's the, like we're opening the door with a very practical issue. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of, you know, in, in a way we've, we've used the pandemic for open streets. We can use the pandemic for getting clean sidewalks. Right, right, right. So I would, I mean, somebody can make a motion on that. This is, we'll, we'll do a very simple letter. Um, and maybe Alan, you can give it a shot to take a draft. Sure. Love to. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was a yes, right? Yes, right. yes. Right. So somebody, uh, somebody make a motion, Dale or, no, not Dale, uh, David, somebody. Okay. I make the motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Not uh, against? Present non-eligible, all good. Okay, so this is a letter on, that's very good. Thank you, Alan. All right, so finally, not finally, because I know that there is a new item, but let's take the new item first. Martin, what is the new item? You, you are in mute, you are on, okay, good. Yeah. Can you hear us, Christine? Yes. I'm speaking for Martin and myself about the proliferation of loud motorcycles on weekends, especially on Ninth Avenue. 
I don't know how far they, I watch them come down from 57th Street. They often turn east on an eastbound street, like 44th Street, sometimes on 42nd Street. They rarely go to Lincoln Tunnel. They're, they seem one, they seem to desire to go to the east side of Manhattan. But anybody who lives in this neighborhood and knows what I'm talking about, or on Saturday, we didn't get to sleep until three o'clock in the morning, even with our windows closed. And I'm wondering if the dot could somehow close off maybe 7th Avenue going downtown and 6th Avenue going uptown in the evenings on weekends, Ooh, which please. are less residential. Martin says it's the police may be working with DOT. That's it. I'm, I'm glad you raised this because I was going to raise it if you didn't, because there seems to be a proliferation of street racing. Yeah, um, it's with, getting worse. Yeah, and it's it's there's a there's a group of bikers and there's also like, you know, drag drag race style street racing that's going on. I heard it last night here on 34th Street. And yeah, so I don't so, know. I don't know what the approach is. That would be the most effective, but. So uh, Brad Oilman is introducing a legislation, right? Against drag racing and, and uh, but that doesn't address just the noise. I mean, you know, uh, so I, I think we need to talk to, um, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Jesse and ask him to, to talk to the NYPD and see if they can yeah. do a special session on, was it on Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, or it's what? disturbing the peace, I guess. It's Friday night, yeah, Saturday What I'm saying night. is that what they, what they- Friday did. night, Saturday night, it was terrible. Last Friday Saturday and night. Saturday night, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I it bleeds it. into Sunday, but okay. it's really the weekends most. I heard it Saturday and Sunday on 34th Street. Amen. Also, presumably, uh, those folks should be getting speeding tickets, amen. one would think. Yeah, what could be done? I mean, the cops don't enforce really speed because I think the state well, gets the money for moving the, violation. That's the uh, law which is being introduced by Brad Oilman is to, would be to put a camera, uh, you know, a camera to enforce. The thing is that these, the street racers, they're not new. They're not brand new. They know they know how to get away with this. Right. They've been doing a lot of street racing in other boroughs. Manhattan is now like, wow, amazing. These avenues are nearly empty at nights. And so they're like, oh, let's go race on 7th Avenue now. So it's like, they're not, they, they know how to get away with it. Well, maybe we could put up obstructions so they can't. Like they'll hit a barricade or something or a can. We could set the avenues on fire at night. On the no, no, I'm not talking about setting <laughs> the avenues on fire. All I'm right, we don't, about, have, we don't have, this is not, this is not a productive discussion. <laughs> well, so, I mean, well, I we, have we have to have a solution, have a solution we, though. I mean, Jesse, what's about the noise? To, what, we're going to talk to Jesse and he's going to talk to NYPD because NYPD needs to enforce that. So yeah. that's, the only, that's the only thing we can do, okay? And also just make clear to Jesse that it's not just um, the usual weekend yeah. scoff laws. It's an, it, these are organized groups that are doing street racing. Right, okay. Mm. Let's talk about the budget for one second. So the budget was, is, um, we are going to do the same thing we did before. Uh, we are going to prioritize the issues uh, and we are going to try to have a very small set of issues that we want to propose because we know there is going to be less money and there is no point in organizing and prioritizing 25 issues if we are going to get money for two, right? So we want to identify what are the top three capital and what are the top three expenses that we want to submit to the budget group, which is then going to merge them and extract the top five probably. So uh, just wanted to mention to you that uh, we're going to add four new items that we, uh, for which we, we included letters. And I think the better way to do it is probably I'll send you a survey and you can all individually rank those 
things and figure uh, whether you want them to be number one, two, three, four, five next year. So we don't have to spend a lot of time. And, and then next month we can discuss further the results or in between we can discuss the results. Is that okay for everybody? Yes. Dale, is okay for you? Yes. I, I, I like the idea of a survey, sure. Right. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's it for today. I'm ready to entertain a motion to adjourn. Janine, motion to adjourn. to adjourn. Yes. Second. Janine, you have the vote? Yeah, I have a vote. Okay, great. Janine, are you able to generate a survey like the one we outlined? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to Katia. She's the one that tends to do the forms and stuff for us, and we'll come up with something. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. That was very interesting. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.